In the top stories, state funeral to be held for the late Sir Cuthbert Sebastian. St. Kitts and Nevis to receive assistance on a project targeting kidney failure. And youth expert outlines priority goals of the draft federal youth policy. The details on these stories and more after the break. Hello and welcome to the ZIZ Channel 5 newscast. I'm Kyla Barrage. Former Governor General Sir Cuthbert Montreville Sebastian, GCMG, OBE, MDED, KSTJ, will be given a state funeral with full military honors on Monday, 10th April. The funeral will be held at the St. George's Anglican Church on Keon Street at 1.30 p.m. Internment will be at the Springfield Cemetery. Monday, 10th April has been declared a national day of mourning by the government and a national half holiday for the public and private sectors has been proclaimed by the Governor General, His Excellency Sir S. W. Tapley Seaton, DCMG, CVO QCJP, to honor the life and contribution to the nation of the late Sir Cuthbert Sebastian. The body of Sir Cuthbert will lie in state at Government House from 8.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. on 10th April for public viewing and all flags on government buildings will be flown at half-staff on the same day. A book of condolences will be opened at Government Headquarters on Friday 7th April from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. and on Monday 10th April from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. for public signing. Sir Cuthbert died on 25th March 2017. He was 95 years old. He has served in St. Kitts, Nevis and Anguilla in a number of capacities, including pupil teacher, senior dispenser, medical superintendent and obstetrician gynecologist. He was chief medical officer of St. Kitts and Nevis from 1980 to 1983. From 1962 to 1966, he pursued training at the Dundee Royal Infirmary Scotland in obstetrics and gynecology. The government continues to put emphasis on the health and well-being of all residents and citizens of St. Kitts and Nevis, as it will soon embark on a project that will target kidney failure. This is being done in collaboration with the Republic of China, Taiwan. During a check handing over ceremony on Wednesday, resident Taiwanese ambassador, His Excellency George Gowi Shu, announced that his government will assist the Federation on a renal failure disease control project starting in April. This support for the health sector was welcomed by Prime Minister Dr. the Honorable Timothy Harris, who said the issue of kidney failure is an area of significant concern. Come April, further support will be coming to the health sector and in particular those who are suffering from kidney ailments and related diseases. This is an important area because this is an area throughout the Caribbean that is a matter of major concern for our people. And so I want to say thanks for the support for health care. Dr. Harris thanked Taiwan for partnering with the government on other projects that will improve the delivery of health care in the Federation. This, he said, includes the renovation of community centers across St. Kitts and Nevis. We are finalizing a number of projects for continuing support this year by your government, including the support for the health sector in particular the building of a modern health facility in Tabernacle that was the only health center that was left undone when there was a series of renovation work being done throughout St. Kitts and Nevis and the health centers. Ambassador Shu said a team of experts from Taiwan will visit the Federation in the coming week to assist with the implementation of the project. Youth expert Dwinet Eversley has noted that it is important to have priority goals so that persons focus on the action areas that are needed to protect young persons and advance the development of the youth. Ms. Eversley appeared on Working For You on Wednesday along with other youth officials where they updated the public on the development of the draft federal youth policy. She said that goals are set in order to obtain meaningful information as it relates to youth. We want to know how youth, young people, their state and their well-being and the impacts of development um, imperatives and, and initiatives in the areas of education, primarily in the area of economic participation, and it means how people participate in the economy, what opportunities and access are available. 
So employment, employability, entrepreneurship, equal opportunities. All of that is economic participation. She also spoke about the importance of health and well-being. And when we introduce the concept of well-being, you know why it is? Because we say health is not only measured by physical health, but by mental health and emotional health. Yes. And now, very recently, Mr. Williams, do you, you will remember that we celebrated International or World Happiness Day? That's correct. And now the experts are telling us we know whether people, countries are going well or whether policies the countries and right, so on. Yeah. or whether policies are relevant based on how happy people are. Public safety and security are also among the priority goals which form part of the federal youth policy and to which the youth expert deemed as important. Ms. Eversley stated that all Caribbean countries, including St. Kitts and Nevis, have to provide a regime of security where people would feel valued. After the break, Culturama Committee mourns the loss of Permanent Secretary Carl Williams and OTI hosts a chef demonstration at Irish Tongue Primary School. Stay with us. <music> Premier of Nevis Honorable Vance Amory has expressed his dissatisfaction over the violent actions on the weekend that resulted in the death of Randall Chapman. In making an address in his capacity as Minister Responsible for Security and also as Area Representative for St. George's Parish, where Chapman lived, Premier Amory expressed condolences to the family of the deceased. He also made an appeal to everyone to assist in curbing the crime situation. I really wish that our people, our young men, our young women, our older people, parents, guardians, that we would begin or continue where we have started to see that we have a role to play in getting rid of the scourge of violent crimes in our country. And I want to, to say to us that we should see this act as one which we will tell ourselves that we are not going to tolerate this anymore. Premier Amory also encouraged parents to be aware of their child's activities and play an active role in steering them away from criminal activity. So parents, if you know your children are involved in any kind of illegal activity, I am imploring you to take the necessary steps to desist, to get them to desist. It is not doing the country any good. It is not doing our reputation any good. And as I have said many times, we are a country which depends on providing a safe and secure environment to attract investment, to attract visitors, because those are the lifelines of our economy. Wendell Chapman was shot on Sunday while playing cricket in Cotton Ground, Nevis. The scene was processed by the Forensic Services Unit and officers discovered a Glock 9mm pistol with one magazine containing 15 rounds of ammunition. The investigation is ongoing. Members of the Nevis community are shaken by the sudden passing of permanent secretary in the Ministry of Culture, Cal Williams, who had been instrumental in the preparation for this year's Culturama. In an interview with ZIZ News, director of the Culturama Secretariat, Antonio Liburd, shared his memories of the late Carl Williams. My memories of the late Carl Williams span over 50 years because we grew up together in the Jindaland area. In 2015, he was appointed permanent secretary and we started to interact together because at that point he had oversight of of culture armor and he would offer some very great suggestions um, as it regards to the development of culture and music and the culture armor. Library said over the past few months Williams introduced a number of initiatives for this year's edition of Culture Armor. Mr Williams was quite passionate about um, Calypso um, and so over the last couple of weeks that he spent um, at the ministry, we were making plans to have a facilitator come to Nevis to conduct some Calypso writing workshops. Also, um, Mr. Williams was, was, was very excited about Culture Armor 43, and he wanted to see a mega festival this year. And so we got together earlier this year and decided that we would refurbish the cultural village. Liburd said the passing of Williams came as a shock to him and the members of his committee. 
It was only last week himself and I, along with the architect, visited the cultural village to make final preparations in terms of the work that we are going to be doing there. I must say that the ministry and uh, the Nevis Culture Armor Committee, the Culture Armor Secretariat, we are deeply saddened by this sudden demise of our permanent secretary. Director of the Culture Armor Secretariat, Antonio Leibert. Students of Irishtown Primary School got a taste of the culinary ast on Thursday when the Ocean Terrace Inn organized a chef demonstration for the school. Here's more. Chef Larry Monrose brought his skills to Irishtown Primary as he showed the students how to prepare two dishes, a fish broth with mahi-mahi and Rice Krispies treats. Two students were chosen to be junior chefs and went through the steps of preparing the dishes guided by Monroe's. At the end of it all, samples were distributed to the attendees. Principal at Irishtown Primary, Jean Nisbet Body, said the exposure to the culinary arts is a good experience for the students. Seeing that they are grade 6 students, they will be entering the high school. It will help them to choose subjects for them in that career path food and nutrition, home, home economic management, they will be able to um, focus on those subjects in becoming chefs or working in any aspect of the hotel industry. Chef Monroe said he was happy to share his passion with the students. I think it's very important to make the children aware of the importance of eating healthy again because if we look at um, the food import bill of the Caribbean as a um, one, it's very high. So we need to start doing something about it. And my mission is to go back to as many Caribbean um, islands as possible to sensitize the youth on how important it is to eat what they grow. And the junior chef said they thought the demonstration was a good idea. As we go up, we have we might not be living with our parents all the time who can cook, so we have to learn some ways to cook food for ourselves. So I think it's a good idea to bring the chef here to encourage them to like help their parents cook, and they will like feel to to be a chef. The cooking demonstration falls under the Tourism Ministry's Tourism Awareness Program, where stakeholders reach out to the schools to raise awareness about the sector and its opportunities. A tourism official told us they hope to hold similar demonstrations in the future at other schools to expose more students to possible career paths within the hospitality sector. Jason Davis for ZIZ News. Coming up, St. Lucia experiences four bomb threats in three days. The details when we come back. Operations in St. Lucia were once again hindered by another bomb threat hoax this week. The risk in fake distress calls to emergency response services has led to strong action from members of the public who are demanding punitive action against perpetrators. More in this report. Anyone traveling to the city via vehicle on Monday morning would have found his or her journey slowed considerably because of backed up traffic. At about 9 a.m., the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court headquarters on the second floor of the waterfront's located Heraldine Rock building received an anonymous phone call indicating the presence of explosives in the building. Emergency evacuation protocol was immediately activated, resulting in all occupants of the building proceeding to their respective assembly points. The RSLPF's Explosive Ordnance Disposal Team, or EOD, informally known as the Bomb Squad, was summoned to the scene along with officers attached to other departments. Gregory Girard is the court administrator of the ECSC. At the time of his off-camera interview, police had not ascertained the presence of explosives in the building. Girard says, bomb or not, these calls should always generate concern. However, if it was a prank call... Wasting people's time. Um, it's a complete waste of time. Um, very bad day, I think, for this kind of thing to happen. You have this is the last week of filing taxes, people in that building, people doing their banking end of the month. I mean, the prank calls I got, which I suspect it is, I don't know for a fact, but it's really a, quite a waste of time. And the dangers of crying wolf? Yes, yeah. 
And but it, I mean, we don't take these things lightly. I mean, even if it happens, we have to follow the protocol. You can't, you can't take chances because um, that can only redound to further sort of injury to persons and more more damage if you want to call it that. So they do it, and we have to follow the procedure. Due to a number of falsified reports in the past, the public worries that a genuine threat may not be taken seriously in the future. The Heraldine Rock Building also houses the Inland Revenue Department, a branch of the Bank of St. Lucia and Invest St. Lucia. Timothy John is a Special Reserve Police Sergeant and Chief of Security with the NIC. We do our drill every morning, um, concerning bomb threat, fire, tsunami and all, any, any eventuality. Um, because of the nature of our buildings, and we have the, it is more or less the government buildings, we are ready and prepared. As you could see, this place is called off even before the bomb squad is there because we are trained to do that. The evacuation procedure went very well this morning. I must say we have our evacuation point, which is Sinuti Park, and also the cultural center grounds. But this, you've seen lots and lots of those in your time here at, 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 in this complex. Your thoughts about that thing are happening all the time? I mean, just two weeks ago, there was one of the courts. Yeah, well, I'm saying that anytime it's a bomb and we receive a call, we cannot take it lightly. We must act. We do not want anybody staying in the building and next thing something happens and they blame us for not evacuating. So it's more as a procedure. And I'm saying that what we have to do right now, based on information we have received or they have received, a telephone number, all they have to do is trace these calls and make people pay for, for, for this thing. Has this happened in the past? Well, yes, we have had a number of calls. Um, but I'm just saying that this one is serious because we just had an explosion in Kalisa not too long ago. So now it's time for action. We have to take things seriously in this country. Less than an hour later, another call was placed to the Laplace Carinage building forcing the closure of Bridge Street and evacuation of a number of business establishments in the vicinity. About two hours later, the East Caribbean Financial Holdings Financial Center building fell victim as well when the bank received a similar call. On Wednesday, traffic along the Castries Grosley dual carriageway ground to a halt when a bomb threat phone call was made to the Monroe College at Vidbute. The strain on resources of the police and fire services due to prank calls and the interruption of operation at various business establishments have incited calls from many members of the public to track down the perpetrators and take them to task. Miguel Favre, HTS News Force. A concerned father has prompted an appeal to the Guyana police to arrest and charge a policeman who struck down his son during a recent vehicle accident. Travis Chase has more. An East Coast father is questioning the basis of the lengthy delay of a hit-and-run incident that almost killed his 12-year-old son, who is a well-recognized athlete. The accident happened months ago at Annandale on the East Coast as his son was about to cross the road. You also for cross the road. When you look, you see a vehicle coming with the speedy vehicle coming. He decided well, he can straight not back. Well, he now can cross the road. And within the, the vehicle is blood on. All he is heavy in hospital. You know nothing else. Nightly News confirmed Wednesday that the man who struck down the child is a policeman who had been attached to the special branch of the Guyana Police Force. Reportedly, the policeman has not been charged since the almost fatal accident and remains on the job. I get on to the traffic chief, I tell the traffic chief that I ordered this man is a police the traffic chief. Let me for no look after my son, and as long as I look after my son, them in authorities would deal with the matter and the issue. The aggravated father is accusing the police of dragging their feet on the matter since all the evidence is clear that one of their own had been driving in a dangerous manner on the roadways. When the police that take the statement from my son since the 5th of December, the police take the statement and say, well, it can take at least a little three, four weeks before any people could come back from the DPP. Now it's three to four months and nothing happened. The child's father truly believes his son was hit accidentally, but once the errant driver made the choice to drive away, it became a crime for which he wants justice. Justice. Justice is what I want for my son. Because nobody give me no justice. Because I is a driver, if I knock down somebody, I sure they can put me behind bars. Because a man is a policeman, he could knock down my son and get off. My son got parents, he got one now. They're not little straight up on the streets. Travis Chase, HGP Nightly News.
Coming up, Anthony Morton stops by to speak with us about the Flow Ultimate Football Experience. Stay tuned. Upfront is next. Hello and welcome to another edition of Upfront. I'm Carla Barrett and in the studios with me is Anthony Morton and he's the commercial manager at Flow. Hello and welcome to Upfront. Thank you, Carla. All right. Now, you're here to speak with us about the Flow Ultimate Football Experience. That's Tell correct. Tell us a little bit about that. It's a tremendous experience, and it's really our pleasure on behalf of Flow to partner with a tremendous football organization like Manchester United to bring it to the Caribbean region on a whole. The Flow Football Ultimate Experience is really about targeting the youth, ages 13 to 16, to see their skill level, test them, and to expose them to so much more. Uh, so on April 8th, we will be inviting 37 participants to take part in the Flow Ultimate Football Experience. Okay, so how does it work exactly? It's Great question. Mm -hmm. um, what we would have done, there would have been a registration process mm -hmm. uh, with the endorsement of the Caribbean Football Union. Uh, we would have contacted the local teams who would have selected one participant to take part in this challenge. And on the 8th, those persons would be there. Okay, now what does the skill challenge entail? Um, as Manchester United is known for their football, mm -hmm. great organization, um, they would have trained local adjudicators to basically drill these um, participants on several skill sets to see who would be the best persons to qualify and represent St. Kitts and Nevis. Okay, so there are two winners what will those winners receive? I love the question and I'm sure the participants and the ultimate winner will too as well. Uh, two representatives along with their coach mm -hmm. and the guardian will be traveling down to Trinidad on May 7th to take part in the finals of the ultimate football experience. Okay. Uh, now in terms of the partnership as we wrap up tell us a little bit about the partnership between Manchester United and Flo. Well, before you wrap up, I do want to mention that once they would have made it to the finals in Trinidad, mm -hmm. um, there will be another finals, um, what would I say, it, uh, challenge experience where the ultimate two winners from that uh, challenge in Trinidad will be traveling to England on the 21st of, okay. um, of May to witness a game live with Manchester United and Crystal Palace and I don't think it gets any better and this Sounds is at exciting. Old Trafford mm -hmm. so it's uh, that's where the ultimate experience comes in okay. and um, you know it's really about making sure that we do our best as a good corporate citizen to develop our youth and make them the best that they can be. Okay. Now in terms of the partnership between Manchester United and Flo, tell us a little bit about that. Definitely. Um, we, we recognize as well as Manchester United that the commitment to our community and development of our youths. So it was a natural marriage between the two organizations. Um, and this is one of many uh, engagements that have taken place through the region. In January, for example, the FA Cup toured the Caribbean. It culminated in the Cayman Islands with Dwight York, an ambassador from Manchester United, would have made his presentation. And uh, we continue to do similar events like the Football Ultimate Experience, just simply to continue to recognize, um, horn, and develop uh, potential dreams that could be lost with our Caribbean use. Okay. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming and speaking with us about the Flow Ultimate Football Experience. It has been my pleasure as well. This has been Upfront. I've been speaking with Anthony Morton. I'm Carla Berridge. More news after this. U.S. District Judge Derek Watson granted a motion by the state of Hawaii to convert a temporary restraining order into a preliminary injunction. News' Dre Straberg has the latest. U.S. District Judge Derek Watson granted a motion by the state of Hawaii to convert the temporary restraining order into a preliminary injunction. 
That means the revised travel ban is blocked indefinitely until further court action. President Trump's second executive order would temporarily ban travel from six Muslim-majority countries and temporarily pause the U.S. intake of refugees. Unlike the previous ban, Iraq is not included, and green card holders and people with visas would be allowed entry. But Hawaii is arguing that the new order still violates the Constitution by discriminating against Muslims. Hawaii Attorney General Doug Chin even called it nothing more than Muslim Ban 2.0. Watson issued the original restraining order earlier this month, just hours before the new travel ban was set to go into effect. Shortly after, Trump called the ruling terrible and vowed to take the case to the Supreme Court if needed. A wealthy Colombian architect has been sentenced to 51 years in prison for the sexual assault and murder of a seven-year-old indigenous girl. Juliana Samboni's death has highlighted the country's deep socio-economic divide. Al Jazeera's Alessandro Rampietti reports from Bogota. It was a crime so monstrous that it shocked the nation all too familiar with violence. The sentence one that promises to become an example. The sanction imposed to Rafael Uribe Noguera reflects the deep rejection of an entire society that has started the journey to guarantee the fundamental rights of its women for future generations. Rafael Uribe Noguera, wealthy architect from a prominent family in Bogota, was sentenced to 51 years and 10 months in prison. He raped, tortured and killed a seven-year-old indigenous girl, Juliana Samboni, in his upscale apartment after kidnapping her in front of her poor house on a Sunday December morning. The prosecutor said the case would set a precedent for the treatment of future minors victims of femicide. This is a milestone for Colombian justice. We received this sentence just four months after the crime was committed. This is unusual in cases like this one in our country. Less than 10 percent are solved. Demonstrators outside the court, though, said it's not enough. There's no true justice for kids in Colombia. 51 years is not real justice. The maximum was 60 years, and that's what we were expecting. What else should the monster have done to deserve it? As details of the crime were revealed last year, angry protests followed, exposing the stark divides between rich and poor in this capital and the troubling rates of violence against women. This is the shanty town just above the architect's apartment where in broad daylight he pulled a girl in his SUV. And it's just the brutal and truly shameless way in which he did this and thought he could get away with it that has so many people deeply horrified. But unfortunately, this is far from an isolated case. This is just the tip of the iceberg in a society that has failed to protect its children. Almost two children are killed every day in Colombia. Last year, nearly 17,000 boys and girls were sexually abused. That's 52 every day. In Juliana's neighborhood, many wonder if the culprit's fortune and political connections will still spare him from serving much of his sentence. But many hope this case will instead end the indifference that has traditionally surrounded such crimes, and that Juliana's horrible death will not have happened in vain. Alessandro Rampietti, Al Jazeera, Bogota. Up next in sports, Arizona high school athletes arrested in hazing case, and world-class soccer player goes vegan and scores. Stay tuned. Members of the U.S. men's national hockey team are reportedly considering a boycott as a show of solidarity with the women's team. Here's more. The World Championship for women's hockey is just days away, and USA Hockey could have another boycott on its hands. The women's team is currently locked in a year-long negotiation with USA Hockey over fair wages. Lawyers for the players say they're only paid about $6,000 every four years. Without, quote, significant progress in those negotiations, the women won't play in the International Ice Hockey Federation World Championship. And an agent representing dozens of NHL players says the men's team could follow suit with a similar boycott of their championship in May. USA Hockey tried to find replacement players for the women's championship, but hasn't been successful. 
So its board went back to the negotiating table Monday, and an agreement still has yet to be made after the two sides met for eight hours. Fellow hockey players aren't the only ones lending support to the women's team. 16 U.S. Senators released a letter to USA Hockey Monday, urging it to end the wage dispute. The women's championship begins Friday. Six Arizona high school student athletes have been arrested on a number of charges, ranging from sexual assault to hazing and kidnapping. Here's more on that story. Six Arizona high school football players were arrested on Wednesday and accused of sexual assault, kidnapping, and aggravated assault in connection with a hazing case. Police said the students were current or former members of the team at Hamilton High School in the Phoenix suburb of Chandler. They said multiple incidents were believed to have occurred on school grounds between September 2015 to January 2017. Five of the students attend Hamilton High School and all were juveniles at the time of the incidents. World-class soccer player and Sunderland striker Jermaine Defoe has scored big in a 2018 World Cup qualifier. Esma. Last Sunday, 34-year-old Sunderland striker Jermaine Defoe scored in England's 2-0 win over Lithuania in a 2018 World Cup qualifier. This added yet another gem to his abundant highlight reel this year. Despite his advancing age, Defoe has maintained his edge for club and country, scoring 14 goals in the English Premier League to go with his most recent international golasso. Defoe hopes to prolong his career by keeping his body in peak condition, which involves various recovery and diet techniques. Among cryotherapy treatment, massages, and realizing the importance of rest days, Defoe has also transitioned to a vegan diet. After his girlfriend convinced him to give it a try, he feels that he's adopted the lifestyle change successfully. He said, I don't find anything hard to give up as such because I know the feeling scoring goals gives me. When we come back, we'll have another look at the stories that made the headlines. Recapping the top stories. State funeral to be held for the late Sir Cuthbert Sebastian. St. Kitts and Nevis to receive assistance on a project targeting kidney failure and youth expert outlines priority goals of the draft federal youth policy. And that's the end of the ZIZER Channel 5 newscast. Thank you for joining us. I'm Gala Verage. Goodbye.